can define for us what a passport is? Don't worry, there's no wrong answer. Um, just don't say a passport is a passport. Um, using the word to define the word. Who can tell us? Shout it out. I don't know if someone can help us. Now, Mike. Thanks, Nekasa. Anyone? Passport. Okay, here we go. I thought I saw a hand. Is that? Yeah, right there. It is a document that establishes you as a citizen of a particular geographical location mm -hmm. encircled by borders. Yeah, these are th all, th all those guys for where? 844 students. Yeah. To now I don't worry. I'm, even me, I'm with you. I was like, oh, yeah, a passport does that. <laughs> okay, someone else. Then that, okay, there, Rayo, on your side, Mao. Hi. Hi. A passport is a document that allows you legal entry into a foreign nation. Okay. It allows you legal entry into a foreign nation. Okay. A couple more. These are all the GCE guys. A passport yeah. is a document that allows you to pass a port. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but he does have a point, right? It allows you literally to pass a port. One more. If you went to a group of schools. Okay, yeah, the back, Stella. Uh, a passport is a small picture. A small a typo. A, a small picture. Ah. <laughs> Just so you know, she's in the worship department of the church. <laughs> so usually that department, you know, there's Bapo and then there's the worship department. We don't know, don't know what happens to them. But we love them anyway. Okay, now that we've established that a passport is a small picture, um, what I want you to ask your neighbor is, if you had a passport, which country would you most want to go to? I'll give you one minute to do that. If you had a passport, which country would you most want to go to? Okay, I'll take three responses. Which country would you most want to go to? <laughs> Pastor Musula says he'd like to go to the Central African Republic. I told you, worship guys, eh? I don't know. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Hi, uh, my friends here said that uh, they would like to go to Israel, except for Ken, he wants to go to Brazil because of the World Cup. Ah, good man. <laughs> good man. Hi, guys. Yeah, my neighbor here says she'd love to go to the UK. She loves the accent. Hello, how you doing? <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, and then I said I'd love to go to Japan because I'm so, I'm, I mean, these ninjas, man, they're so cool. So, yeah. You want to see some? Yeah. Isn't, isn't that an oxymoron, seeing a ninja? I thought that. Which one, Ninja? Too? No, I'm playing. I'm playing with you. <laughs> it's okay. You know what I like about Kenyans? Kenyans will travel anywhere in the world and come back with an American accent. <laughs> like, they'll go to India and come back like, hi, how you all doing? You're like, boys, they don't talk like that in India. <laughs> one more. Hey, guys don't want to travel? There we go. Yeah. Okay, my name is Jay. Uh, my friend on my left said you would like you would like to go to Brazil because of the same reason of World Cup. On my right, she said she would like to go to Turkey. She didn't give me a reason why she would like to go to Turkey. Personally, I'll go to England and in specific Manchester to watch Manchester <laughs> United, no matter what. By the way, how did that game go yesterday? Uh, oh yeah. Just saying, just you know. Man United. Okay, Sasawa, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for, oh, there's one more. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, well, my friend here wants to go to India because of the culture. And I personally will want to go to Saudi Arabia because I want to do missions there. Yes. Yeah. The rest of us who had shallow reasons, <laughs> now is a good time to repent. <laughs> thank you. Um, 
please come back with an indian accent i think it will be the coolest thing what you do where you go i think it will be the coolest thing ever we've been taking a flight okay since january we've been taking a flight to our glorious destination and our glorious destination is making disciples okay and a disciple is someone who has eternal life we have been called to be those who reconcile sinners to god and our glorious destination is making disciples for the glory of god however there's some bad news that happened on this flight of ours okay there's some bad news and some good news which one do you want first bad news or good news bad news. but why do guys always want the bad news okay bad news here's the bad news some guys don't have passports so that means they cannot enter the republic of eternal life sorry there's good news do you have the good news yes okay the good news is everyone can get a passport okay everyone can get a passport and everyone can get into the republic of eternal life now the emissary was going to take us basically through the book of galatians and kind of set the tone of galatians what was happening here um who was who was paul addressing what was going on um in the context and though i cannot do it as ably as as our emissary uh, i'll give a, a small sh- hey, snapshot snapshot <laughs> hey Yeah, oh my god ilikuja na meli na wajaluo hawakuzika so i'll give a snapshot of galatians so if you have your bibles go to galatians chapter 1 okay now in in paul's writing and basically in the writing of the greco roman world at the time people would generally start off with four things they start off introducing themselves i am so and so then they'd have a prayer they'd say um this is what i'm praying for you i'm hoping that this happens to you because you know it's like it's like those guys who used to write letters in high school don't lift up your hands um but those guys who used to write letters in high school would say hi i'm christian i think you're so nice and i hope that you continue being nice and my prayer for you is that god will make you even nicer okay so paul starts out his letters like that paul an apostle of god called by the will of god to be a servant of god grace and peace to you and to the brothers in ephesus um i or in philippi i remember you with joy every time i remember you in my prayers but in galatians check out how he starts galatians chapter 1 from verse 1 paul an apostle sent not from men nor by man but by jesus christ and god the father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers with me right grace and peace to you skip down grace and peace to you from god our father and the lord jesus christ note he doesn't even have a prayer for them okay that's a pretty big deal when we see throughout the book what his problems are what his issues are and his introduction right from the start is a bit curious right he says paul an apostle sent not from men nor by man isn't that kind of curious if i said see, usually you'd just come and say hi i'm christian um i'm from masogo yes okay that they they're telling me the emissary is ready so okay go for it galatians is a letter i think that is uh, what we must underscore it is a letter it is an epistle and like all letters in those days a letter had three important parts the first part of the letter was an introduction the second part of it was a body and the last part was a conclusion in the introduction the sender identified himself or herself in those days so they will positively state who they are then they will next address the people that they are sending their letter to so it will be to so and so for this case it is to the churches in galatia then next they will send their greetings and so they will write greetings and and for paul and others who write in the new testament they say grace and peace to you perhaps because of their jewish uh, heritage they included that greeting of grace and peace to you and then finally they will say a prayer they will say i am praying for you so and so that the lord will help you will increase you in love just like paul when he prays and writes to philemon so they will write a prayer and sometimes in that prayer they will commend them for their good work that they are doing and then finally there will be a conclusion at the end in the conclusion they also will send greetings 
Greet so and so, whom I love so much. Greet so and so, the beloved one, the co worker, and Paul and others who write in the New Testament who will send greetings. But in between the introduction and the conclusion is the body. In the body is the main idea, the purpose for writing, their arguments, what they are convinced of and they want to communicate will be contained in the body. And for a larger part of the epistle will be concerned with the main purpose for writing, Galatians. Allow me to say that Galatians, in the introduction, the writer is Paul. He says, Paul, an apostle. But notice that Paul does not state his identity positively. He states it negatively, not from. I do not come to you and say, I am Nelson Makanda, not from NPC. I meant not from Nairobi Pentecostal Church. But I say, I am Nelson Makanda from Nairobi Baptist Church. But here Paul states negatively. And you must understand why he says that. So it is important that you note, this is the only epistle that Paul writes in that manner. So there's a problem with his apostleship in Galatia. And so he states that way. And then he writes the recipients in verse 3 to the churches of Galatia, whom he will refer to as you in the next, uh, I mean, in the body. And then he will refer to them formally, who are Gentiles, who are sinners. And then next, he sends grace to you and peace in verse 3. And notice that there is no prayer for the Galatians. And there is no commendation for the Galatians. He moves straight to the body. So unlike other letters, in the other letters, there is a prayer and there is an encouragement. And there is a commendation to the people he's writing to. But to the Galatians, no. He moves straight to verse 6 and begins to deal with the body what he wants to write. Allow me to paint a picture for you what was happening in Galatia. Paul had been to Galatia, he had preached, and they had received Christ. He had told them that for you to become a child of Abraham, you only need to believe the gospel. You have to believe that God sent Jesus Christ and he died for you on the cross. He redeemed you. And once you believe that message, you become a child of Abraham. And for them as Gentiles, they felt, wow, I do not have to be circumcised to be a child of Abraham. To be a Christian, I don't have to be. To be identified, I don't have to pick up the law. But after Paul had left, some other people came and they told the Galatians, look here, Paul did not tell you the whole truth. He is not a true apostle. He is not one of the twelve. He was not there. In fact, he was a persecutor of the church. So he didn't have the full content. And what's the full content? The full content is that for you to be saved, you must also be circumcised. And for some reason, the Galatians believed that lie. The lie that they must be circumcised to be saved. The lie that Paul was not an apostle like the others. And so what does Paul do? Paul writes to reclaim that lost truth. The truth about his apostleship and his ministry and the truth of the gospel. And to rebuke the Galatians for their wavering loyalty. And how does he do it? From chapter 1, verse 6, to the end of chapter 2. And from chapter 4, verse 8, to verse 20. Paul sets aside a half of the epistle to write his autobiography about himself. And what does he highlight? He highlights, he highlights his apostleship, the message that he preached, and how loyal he was to the one who called him. His faithfulness. And then when he turns to the next part, so part A of the letter of the body is autobiography. And then part B of the epistle, chapter 3 from verse 1 to verse 7, uh, sorry, uh, 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 to chapter 4 verse 7, and continuing from chapter 4 verse 21 to the end of chapter 6, Paul devotes himself to giving examples of loyalty. People who are faithful to the promise. And so he highlights Abraham. 
Abraham was faithful when he was called. He was a Gentile, but yet received the promise of God with faithfulness. But you Galatians, you failed in that mark. He will move on and raise up the issue of Isaac and his brother Ishmael and says Ishmael was that son of the promise. And so if you want to become the son of the promise, you must believe the promise. You do not do anything else to receive the promise. It is received by faithfulness. You must be loyal. So he paints the picture of loyalty to the Galatians. And he tells the Galatians that there are some who want to persuade you so that you may be turned away. He says they trouble you. And he will use those connotations. He does not identify them by name. He calls them some. Have you heard some people saying wengine? Have you heard that? Paul uses that connotation here. In verse 7 he says, some. And in chapter 6 he says, some. He doesn't call them by name. Those other people who are persuading Galatians to forget about their passport and miss out on the promise. Thank you. So, I don't know if you guys have noticed our resident bridge. Um, in our flight, it is necessary that you have a passport, not just nice, that you have a passport. Okay? Same way if you showed up at someone's border and said, ah, let me in. They'll, the first question they'll ask you is, show me your passport. Right? They're not too interested in anything else. And for the next few minutes, what I really hope for us to do in just these first 10 verses of Galatians chapter 1 is to answer three questions. Number one, what is the gospel? Number two, is there another gospel? Number three, in whose authority do we preach the gospel? Okay? So if you're writing down, now would be a good time to take notes. If you have a tablet, you can swipe. If you have neither of the above, you know, just be in prayer. Um, but those are the three questions. Number one, what is the gospel? Number two, is there another gospel and finally in whose authority do we preach the gospel question one was okay let's take it with a little more energy question one was what is the gospel it sounds like a pretty basic question what is the gospel glad you asked there's a long definition to it and I, I don't think these words are reducible, but it's a really simple thing when you think about it. What is the gospel? The gospel is good. What? Ah, okay, so let's shout that word. The gospel is good news. The gospel is good news of what God has done in Christ to give eternal joy to those who would put their faith in him and rescue them from eternal wrath. The gospel is good news. It's a message. The gospel is good news of what God has done in Christ to give eternal joy and eternal hope to those who would put their faith in him and rescue them from eternal wrath. Galatians chapter 1. After Paul gives his introduction in verse 4, he basically spells out the gospel. Here it is. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. God himself gave himself. It's John 10 where Jesus says, I lay down my life for my sheep because I love my sheep to rescue us from this evil age, to rescue us from the wrath of God that was coming. Because the wages of sin is, there is a consequence to sin. There is a consequence to obey overtly or clearly spitting on God that carries with it a consequence and the consequence is death eternal separation from God he rescued us from that or as I love how it's put in 2nd Corinthians 5 21 God made him who had no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God man was on this side of the bridge God was on that side of the bridge and there was no long jump that was going to get us from there to there 
We were doomed. If we fell in the middle, we'd fall right into hell. But God made him who had no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. The gospel is the news that God has made a way, the way to be precise, for us to be one with him, to be reconciled with him. Well, let me put it this way. Um, Pastor Omusula, if you could please stand on this side. This is Pastor Omusula. Everyone say, yay! Good job. Okay, he's going to face you guys. Pastor Omusula will be God for now. Mau, come. Mau represents all of us as sinners. Okay? Now here's something I love doing. When we talk about you and me as sinners, usually we think, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I'm not that bad. Okay, so let's do a, a, a straw poll. I love doing this. You guys have probably seen me do this before. Um, how many of you have ever lied in your life? Yeah, the guys whose hands are down. You're lying now. <laughs> okay, how many of you have ever stolen something in your life? Yeah, these half hands were like, it was just a pencil. How many of you have stolen something in your life? Yeah, there we go, everyone in the room. Okay, don't put your hand up. How many of you have ever looked at a member of the opposite sex um, lustfully? Just blink. <laughs> That's all of you. Okay, um, how many of you have ever hated someone in your heart and just gone like, they walk into the room and you're like, ugh. Again, those whose hands are down, you're lying now, but Jesus loves you? Okay, so what do you call someone who lies? What do you call someone who steals? A stealer. <laughs> 844. Four. Let me tell you. A thief. Okay. Jesus said if you look at a woman lustfully in your own heart, and that same can be said if you look at a man lustfully in your own heart, you have committed adultery with her. So those of you who blinked. Jesus said if you hate someone in your own heart, you have committed murder. Right? So by your own admission, you and I are all lying, thieving, adulterers, murderers. That's us. God is on one side of the bridge. Mao representing us lying, thieving, adulterers, murderers are on the other side. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird being called that. Eh? But that's what we are. So this is us. This is God. Is God going to say, oh, welcome to my kingdom, lying, thieving, adulterous, murderer? Really? No. There is no day and no way that God is going to be okay with this guy. There's no way God is going to be okay with us. Because God has no association with sin. He is the father of light. In him is light and there is no shadow. This is nothing but shadow. So what's he to do? Answer, nothing. Remember, no long jump can get him there. Okay? He might be the best, best person in the world, but he's still sinful and filthy in God's eyes. It's like getting two people who can swim and saying, okay, both of you, swim. One is Michael Phelps, the other is Christian, who swims like a dog, dog paddle. And you put us both in Mombasa and say, swim until Mumbai. Doesn't matter how great Michael Phelps is, he's not getting there. We are both dead. So there's no such thing as, I'm bad, but I'm better than, in God's eyes. None of us can get there. So what does God do? Majid, if you could join me. And stand up there. Majid, our oh dear Majid. Everyone say, yay, Majid. Majid. Facing, facing that. There we go. Majid will represent, for now, God the Father. Pastor Omusula over here is God the Son, Jesus Christ. God himself yes. looks at that guy and says, <laughs> this is not going to work. He can't get here. So he comes all the way across the bridge and looks at sinful man and says, I am your only hope. I'm not saying that because I'm arrogant. I'm saying that because I love you. Lying, thieving, adulterous murderer here says, Enyewe, you're my only hope. That's great. But the father who is offended by sin still has every intention of sending this guy to eternal wrath. Because the wages of sin is. So it's great that he's recognized his only hope, but it's not going to help him much. Lying, thieving, adulterous murderer has to say, Jesus, help. 
take me. So Jesus says, okay, so sour, let's trade places. So Jesus steps over here, lying, thieving, adulterous, murderer. No, Jesus stays there. <laughs> lying, thieving, adulterous, murderer goes that side. God made him who had no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. On that cross, God the Father treated Jesus like he had committed every sin that would ever be committed by everyone who would ever believe in him. Then turns around and treats the sinner like he had never committed a sin. Let me make it more practical. On that cross, God treated Jesus like he had lived my life. Then turned around and treated me like I'd lived Jesus' life. Greater love hath no man than that. This is the gospel. Thanks, guys. You can sit. This is the gospel. There is no message greater than this. That God himself gave himself to save us from himself. That God was just and holy and demanded a sacrifice for sin, but was loving, so provided the sacrifice for sin. The million dollar question is, do we believe the gospel? Have we said as lying, thieving, adulterous, murderers, I have no hope. I have no hope. God, please help me. I have no hope. Have my life. I have no hope. I turn away from sin. Have me. That's the million dollar question. But to be clear on what the gospel is, that is the gospel. That God made him who had no sin to become sin on our behalf. That we might become the righteousness of God. And this is what Paul makes clear in verse 4 when he says, Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins. Not because Jesus did something wrong. But for our sins. To rescue us from the present evil age that was going to be judged by God and that is still going to be judged by God. We were rescued from his wrath. And according to the will of God the Father. See, it's not like Jesus and God were having a fight. I keep saying it's not like God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Did you ever play that game of drawing sticks? Then someone who picks the short stick goes to the other team. It's not like the three of them drew sticks and they were like, okay, Sasa, who's going to earth? Who's going to die for sin? Then Jesus picks the short stick. Ah, it's you! It's not how it worked. Jesus wanted to do this. Because he so loved you and so loved me. And this is not a message that we outgrow. It's not like, yeah, 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 I know that message. I don't need that. No. Our life not only stems from this, it stays in this. Because if we do not recognize how loved we are in the gospel, our whole lives will be an exercise in works and not grace. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. When we miss that, then we start doing things to try and impress God. As though he needs impressing. When we miss that, he just took our place. Not because we deserved it. Eh? Please note, lying, thieving, adulterous, murderer on this side wasn't looking for God. He was running from God. And God said, let me chase you because you have no hope. So let me help you. And that's what he does our whole lives. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. That there was a holy yet loving God who demanded wrath for sin but provided the sacrifice for sin, that whoever believes in him, whoever puts their faith in him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is why the first question is answered, but the second question is necessary. What is the gospel? We've just explained. What God did in Christ to give eternal joy to whoever would put their faith in him and rescue them from eternal wrath. That's the gospel. But see, Paul has a, secondary, a second concern here. He's like, this is the gospel. Just in case you guys had missed it, because Paul planted this church, right? In Acts 13, he had worked with this church, he had taught them the gospel, and he had left. But between the time he left and the time he came back, it's like someone had lied to them. Between the time he left and the time he came back, it's like they had abandoned the gospel. You know, you know how... how <laughs> Pastor Makanda used this, this example earlier, how you can katia chile, like, hey, you're so hot, yeah, I know, okay, yeah, can I buy you 
chili mango. Yes, okay. Girls look at me like, there's no way you're going to buy me chili mango. Will you take me to KFC? You guy. Uh, KFC is expensive. So, you can, you can woo a girl, right? And then you say, okay, let me take a, a short trip. And then you take a short trip, and while you are gone, someone else comes for, hey, is up. Let me take you to Java. And she's like, ah, and she goes to Java. The same idea was happening to the Galatian church. Paul had warned these guys over. He had told them, look, God loves you and has made a way, the way, the truth, and the life for you to be reconciled with God. And they were like, yes. Then he left for a bit. And while he was gone, these guys called the Judaizers crept in. And they were like, they were, they were attacking two things. One, they were attacking the gospel. They were saying, wait, that's, that's not a full gospel. You can't just be saved by faith, rather by grace through faith. No, 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 that's not enough. Yes, you can be saved by grace through faith if you get circumcised. Because these were Gentiles, so they never used to circumcise. So these Judeans I said, no, 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 there's nothing like just put your faith in Jesus. You have to get circumcised. And then you not only have to get circumcised, you have to stop eating certain foods from the Mosaic law. And then you not only have to stop eating certain foods, you have to go do these temple things that we do. Otherwise, you're not saved. And Paul comes back to find them doing this, which is why his, his statement in verse 6 makes, makes perfect sense. Like, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the, what's the word there? Grace of Christ, not by the works of men. He was like, wait, wait, you have to do what? That was number one, they were attacking the gospel, but number two, they were attacking Paul as an apostle. They were saying, this Paul who preached to you, is he really an apostle? You know, he didn't, he didn't spend that three and a half years with Jesus. I don't know that he's an apostle. Has he even seen Jesus? Wasn't he the same one who was persecuting the church? This guy is not an apostle. So these Galatians were like, Hiya, we've not only believed the wrong gospel, our messenger was fake. So now Paul has to not only answer the question, what is the gospel, which he clarifies in verse 4. He has to answer the question, is there another gospel? Because these Judaizers have come with another gospel. They're saying you are saved, by circumcision, you are saved by following Mosaic law, you're saved by things you do. Paul is like, <sighs> okay. Verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. The short answer to the question, is there another gospel, is no. Paul is not surprised here because he's, he's found, hey, yeah, there's another gospel. No, he's surprised because he can't believe these guys would trade that kind of substitution for anything else. He can't believe these guys would trade that kind of substitution for following mosaic laws and do's and don'ts and circumcision. He just, he's like, wait, you're doing what? That's why he's surprised because there is no other gospel. And he refers to these people as some people, those people. Okay, Paul is not at he happy with them. He's not happy. Growing up, when, when your mom wanted you to do something, or wanted us to do something, she'd be like, oh, baby, oh, sweetie, oh, good boy. When you upset her, she was like, Nyathino, that child. And usually she'd tell my father, you are son. Okay? That's what Paul is doing here. He's like, those people, eh? Some people. He's not amused with them. They are false teachers leading people astray, sending them to eternal condemnation. And just to make it clear that there's only one gospel and that they are perverting the gospel and turning it to, into something about works and not grace, check out verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8 of Galatians. But even if we, so he's throwing himself in there, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be, what are the next words? eternally condemned. The ESV says, accursed, anathema. Let him be destroyed eternally. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody, Paul is not saying if some people preach one thing and some people another, it's okay. No, he says if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be accursed, eternally condemned. Paul's not playing games here with the gospel. He's clear what it is. He understands how much it took for God to watch his son die. And the thought of someone saying, you have to do something to get saved, repulses him. He's not playing games with the gospel. And neither should we. Because there's only one of two ways you're saved, right? You're either saved by grace through faith, or you're saved by works. 
We are either saved by saying, God, you loved me and gave yourself for me a sinner. So I put my faith in you. Or you're saved by doing a couple of things. Do you have your passport? Imagine if you went to an immigration office. And as far as you know, actually, let's, let's rewind. Before you get to the immigration office, one person tells you you need a passport. So Pastor Musula tells me, you need a passport. I'm like, oh, okay, sour. let me get a passport. And then just as I'm going to get a passport, Mao tells me, no, 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 what you need eh, is a record that you have been a Kenyan citizen. So what you need is to get a birth certificate, then you need to get your certificate from class one when you won baby race, then you need to get your certificate from your rugby team to show that you actually played for a school team that was in Kenya. Then after that, you need to show that you went to a Kenyan university and you have a whole heap of, of a file, big heap, okay? If you went to the immigration office with a big heap, and they said, let me take you through how I'm a Kenyan citizen. Here's my birth certificate, and then here is my class one, what do you think they'd ask you? Talk to me. What do you think they'd ask you? Where's your passport? Like, we don't care about your file. Where's your passport? If you and I think for a minute that we'll get to the throne room of God, the judgment room of God, and say, God, look, in class one, I told on the guy who was making noise behind me. And then in class three, I made for my mama cake. He's going to be like, um, where's your passport? I'm glad you did all those things. Those are awesome. Where's your passport? Is my son on you? Where's your passport? Because if you're still on this side of the bridge, you're done. I'm done. Here's why this is a big deal for us. If you have a passport, you're already on this side, not on that side. Now, getting the passport doesn't mean you do stuff. This sounds like it's basic, but it really isn't. Because there are, quote, another bunch of Gospels out there. In this relativistic, pluralistic age, there are a whole heap of Gospels. Here's one Gospel. The New Age Gospel. That there are many ways to heaven. There are many ways to cross this bridge. There are many ways to get to God. Jesus is one of them. Muhammad is one of them. If you're a really nice person, is one of them. Eastern religions is one of them. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, not a way. Not one of many. The way. The truth. The life. There's one way. And Paul is saying there is no other gospel. There is none. Not a new age one, not a pluralistic one. It's one. And you are saved by grace, through faith, by giving your life to him. By giving my life to him. And then best of all, the third question. He's answered the question, what is the gospel? He answered the question, is there another gospel with an emphatic no? And he answers the third question, in whose authority do we preach the gospel? Go to verse 10. Actually, no, let's start from verse 1. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by man, but by, next two words, next two words, Jesus Christ and God the Father. Paul knows where the seat of his authority is. Verse 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul does not derive his authority to preach the gospel from people, from an organization. He doesn't preach the gospel because he thinks it will get him bonga points. He doesn't preach the gospel because he thinks people will fall in love with him and like him. He preaches the gospel because he has been given marching orders by his king. Matthew 28, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples. It wasn't a request. It's called the great commission from the word command, not the great suggestion. We were given marching orders. And it is these marching orders that Paul is carrying out. This is his authority. That he is doing it on God's authority. So when people ask him, Paul, who are you? Who, should you? who should you be to tell us how to get to heaven? His answer is a confident, I'm no one. But the person who sent me is everything. He's everything. There was once um, in our rugby team that uh, the captain was, was ill, so he couldn't make practice. 
And the vice captain wasn't as, as boisterous as an, and as loud a figure as our rugby captain. So he was a, a bit of a quiet guy. And the way our team worked, there was only a captain and vice captain. That was it. There was, there was no, other, no one else in the chain of command. And then a bunch of us really didn't want to do laps that day. We were just like, can we just play the game? This thing of warming up, CGE, training, fitness, ah, Z. So um, the rest of the team came ready. They were like, okay, so, so how, many, how many sets are we doing? How many laps are we doing? Us guys are like, ah, we're not doing laps, we're not doing laps. Let's just play the game. Yeah, let's play the game. So we were about to start. <laughs> then the vice captain came. He was like, wait, 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 wait. no. We're doing laps. You're like, ah, you guy, watch out, yeah, Jimaze, Unabo, all those things that, you know, you say to someone to discourage them from doing the right thing. But he was like, no, we're doing laps. Now, at the end of the day, the person with the authority to tell us whether to do laps or not was this captain and vice captain. The vice captain was acting on the authority of the captain. Now, if the captain was there and decided we're doing laps, there'd be no conversation. We'd just go. Right? And this is Paul's point. I'm not acting here on my own authority. The authority I have, I was given by God. And he happens to have, oh, I don't know, all authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And this is part of why I love our church's campaign in 2014. We are not reaching five lives to impact Nairobi and beyond because we are such amazing people. We have been given authority by he who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of our all creation. We have been given authority by the person who said, let there be and it was. So when someone asks, by whose authority should you make disciples? By whose authority should you preach this gospel to us? I don't have any of my own. But he who has all authority commanded me to make disciples. And we are compelled by love. Paul loves the Galatians. He loves them. And he's upset that someone is leading them astray. He's upset at them that they could be led astray. But he doesn't want them to be led astray. And if you and I are here and we are claiming, oh, I love my family. I love my friends. Jesus says, then make disciples. Preach the gospel. Because I cannot love them and not tell them about the best thing for their eternal good. I just can't. I can't say, oh, I love lying, thieving, adulterous, murderer, mau. But I don't want him to go to heaven. I don't love him. I don't love him. Because love is doing what is in the highest good of someone else. And Mao's highest good is to be on this side of the bridge. So things for us to think about. Number one. Have you responded to the gospel? Have you said, Jesus, I'm a hopeless, helpless sinner. Save me. If you're here and you're saying, yes, I'm on this side of the bridge, we were not called to sit on this side of the bridge and say, YOLO, pilot, and enjoy ourselves here. That's not how it works. We were called to be on this side of the bridge, stretch out our hands like dying men to other dying men and say, come, come, ye who are weak and heavy laden, come. Your Lord loves you and is waiting for you. Come. Aren't you tired of this lifestyle? Come. Aren't you tired of that emptiness you feel every morning after you wake up from sleeping with your boyfriend? Come. But not only for the temporal benefits. But we get Jesus. Eternal joy. Eternal hope. And I get to reach out to five lives. If five lives in heaven came and told me, Christian, I'm here because of you. I think I'd cry for eternity. If five lives shook your hand in heaven and said, the only reason I'm here is because you are bold enough to not care what I thought and loved me enough to tell me the truth, that there's a God who loves me but is angry at me and will send me to hell, but he sent his son to bring me across the bridge. If five people shook your hand for that in eternity, can you imagine something better? God gave himself to save us from being on that side of the bridge. Would you consider calling men into reconciliation with God, calling women into reconciliation with God? And I'll ask the worship team to join me. There's a song they sang that says, Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. And one of those verses says, 
when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of my guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. And here's how. Because the sinless Savior died. My sinful soul was counted free. And God the just was satisfied to look at him and pardon me. Why wouldn't we share that with five people? Why wouldn't we share that with everyone? In a little bit, I'll be inviting you to pray. I know it's not easy. It's not easy telling someone, oh, have you heard of the four spiritual laws? It's not easy telling someone, do you know God's plan for you? It's not easy to asking someone, do you know if, whether you'd go to heaven or hell if you died today? It's not easy. We know, we know that. It's kind of spooky. But would you ask God to give you and I the courage to share this message of hope to the ends of the earth? And if you're here and you're saying, hey, me, this message is great, but honestly, I, I haven't responded to it. We'll also be giving you an opportunity to do so. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are the most beautiful thing in the universe. The most loving being in the universe. And your word says that God is love. You don't just have it, you are it. Grant, Lord, now that you save those among us who do not know you. But grant, Lord, that for those of us who are saved, you'd help us open up our mouths and say this message of the gospel, because gospel, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Would you help us reach our five? I pray. 